Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this event, which is co-hosted by the Department of War Studies, King's College London, uh, and RUSI. Uh, my name is Michael Goodman. I'm a Professor of Intelligence and International Affairs, Head of the Department of War Studies at King's. Uh, and I'm delighted to be co-hosting this event with RUSI, a long-time partner of War Studies and a great collaborator in events. <clears throat> this is part of the War Studies at 60 anniversary celebrations. Uh, War Studies was founded 60 years ago, hence the name, in 1961 by Sir Michael Howard. And Michael Howard had this great view, uh, himself a veteran of World War II, that actually if you wanted to study war, it required moving beyond the confines of traditional military history to a consideration of its political, economic and social contexts. And since that point, 60 years ago, War Studies has grown enormously. Um, today we have over 100 full-time members of staff, we have over 270 staff uh, in the department overall, 1,600 students spread across four BA degrees, 14 MA degrees and a PhD program. And we've moved from quite a narrow look at strategy, military history, um, to everything surrounding the worlds of war, security and conflict, from the origins of wars, the conducts of wars, post-conflict reconstruction, proliferation, cyber, intelligence, uh, you name it, we study it. And the focus of War Studies at 60, of which this uh, event is past, is looking at the past, present and future of War Studies, looking at where we've come from, where we are now and where we might go into the uh, future. And one area we're really focusing on is uh, War Studies Futures Scholarship Programme to provide 60 scholarships over the next 10 years to students from low income, widening participation uh, backgrounds. And I'd just like to finish this very brief introduction uh, with some words which come from our newest War Studies BA video, which were provided by one of our PhD students. Uh, and he said, we're not here to teach or learn how to win wars. We're here how to learn about the phenomenon of war in its general sense. And so with that, I shall close my opening remarks uh, and pass across to Deborah Haynes, the security and defence correspondent for Sky News. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And um, I'm here with uh, General David Petraeus, who doesn't really need much introduction, I'm sure. Um, people will know him. He's a partner at KKR, the global investment firm, but will probably know him better for his 37 year military career, including six consecutive commands, uh, which included the surge in Iraq back in 2007, mm -hmm. and also commanding forces in Afghanistan uh, before he then became the director of the CIA. So a man of huge experience on the defense and security front. So thank you ever so much for being in conversation. Now, in, in terms of what we're going to be doing, it's going to be a sort of 25 minute chat mm -hmm. between you and I, uh, which will be on the record. And then we're going to move to questions from the audience. And I think uh, our, we've got some people here in the room and then also uh, in, in their homes and offices uh, on Zoom. And I think you've got a question and answer function. And if you wouldn't mind when you ask your questions to identify your name and affiliation, then that would be much appreciated. And those question and answers will be off the record. If that's all right, that's fine. Uh, and yeah. obviously, the theme of the uh, of the discussion is sort of the future of geopolitics post pandemic. Even though we're still in the pandemic, I guess so. <laughs> um, premature. I, I thought we should just start maybe just with your reflections. People, um, experts, were sort of looking at the pandemic um, in the early stages and 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 wondering the impact it had on on the balance of global power. Talk about how it's accelerating yes. a general shift in trend mm -hmm. towards this rise of China, yes. authoritarianism, yeah. the diminishing of, of democracies, the fragmentation of the West. Um, what do you think now, you know, sort of nearly two years on? Well, first of all, thanks for doing this. Thanks to King's, uh, for which I have enormous respect. Uh, I worked closely. I knew Sir Michael Howard very, very well, had enormous admiration for him. And of course, he was honored by Rusi, as was uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman, uh, with whom I also worked uh, there over the years. But many Americans have actually chosen that path to particularly get a PhD and, and a number of them in, in uniform and in security studies. So thanks for the contribution that you have made. And Deborah, you know, you and I have done this in so many different incarnations over the years as you and I both have had uh, different positions. It's always good to do this. And I always have to ask up front, 
how is how old is the biscuit boy now uh, who made an early appearance on one of your shows uh, asking <laughs> mommy for a biscuit yeah that that is my son charlie who actually General Petraeus first met when he was in my tummy. I was about five months yeah. pregnant and I remember coming over and you kindly uh, did an interview with me. Um, yeah, Charlie is now five and still liking his biscuits. I will pass <laughs> on your best wishes again. Please, <laughs> please give him one. It said that General Petraeus asked it. Uh, <laughs> you give that. You know, you, you're right that in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, there were lots of notable folks and I maybe was, at least I was among them, whether notable or not that said that crises tend to accelerate existing trends. And the trend at the time, of course, was in some respects, it was literally the return of geopolitics. I mean, we had gone, we were very much now into uh, the rise of China and the whole future is Asia uh, kind of scholarship and thinking. But as this has gone on, um, it's not quite as clear, I don't think, uh, that it is all going to play out that way because of issues involving supply chains because of recognition that perhaps you shouldn't assemble all of your iPhones or manufacture all of your whatever in one location in one country because if it gets hit and it shuts down, then it all stops. So the diversification, there were already labor uh, cost trends in China that were leading to some offshoring or Southeast Asia or even onshoring coming home. You have the rise of the robots that is still having ramifications where you don't need labor much at all and it can just all come home and be done by machines. So you have all of these different factors that are still playing out. And frankly, the US was coming roaring back uh, once we got vaccination going and everything else. And then we got hit with the Delta variant and it clearly slowed down that particular recovery. And there's still a lot of dynamics uh, in the biggest economy of the world involving labor force uh, participation and a handful of other issues uh, that have to be worked through. And of course, we're in the throes right now in Washington today of the president having delayed his trip to the G20 so that he could put together a package that will inject another probably, it's multiple trillions of dollars. The one that's 1.75 that's been announced the outline, but there was another one that is also in the infrastructure spending in that is very, very considerable and over time will increase productivity in the US and so on. So again, I, I think now it's too soon. Um, and the old econ economics professor in me would say it depends. And you would have to look at a variety of, make a variety of different assumptions uh, about what will play out, certainly very much involving the US, involving the EU and the UK and uh, involving Asia, principally among that obviously being the extraordinary rise of China that has done something in 42 years since Deng Xiaoping welcomed the world to China that no other country in history has ever achieved. And there is a, even a systemic component in this uh, because there is the dynamic of a Western democratically elected governments uh, with generally free market economics, um, in a sense, competing with a Chinese system of a Chinese Communist Party government that has demonstrated considerable competence has some very different features particularly when it comes to certain freedoms, and then a hyper-competitive you know, state capitalism or what have you, but which has state-owned enterprises uh, in it as well. So, and, and of course this, which you know, defeated, if you will, the system of the Soviet Communist Party in a command economy, um, and you know, the end of history was proclaimed and so forth. Well, history is back with a vengeance, and even Francis Fukuyama has written roughly that, having written the original uh, end of history essay. And, um, and again, how that plays out actually has some very significant uh, elements to what happens uh, as a result, not just of the pandemic, but because of the pandemic and a variety of other features that were already starting to influence geopolitics writ large. And I guess one of them has got to be climate change and we are ahead very much so, yeah. coming up with this, yeah. the COP26. And, and of course, another reason that President Biden delayed is because there are major elements of climate uh, in that particular package that he is trying to finalize with Congress. And so that he can go to uh, Glasgow and actually have something tangible uh, without which obviously it's pretty hard to lead. Uh, and there is a commitment, I think, uh, of this president, a, a sense that the US does need to lead certain activities around the world. And if you're going to get something done in some of these, you actually have to, again, have set an example in certain regards uh, and so forth. And so again, the same with the G20, 
uh, to which he's headed either now or soon will be. And, and just on, on the climate security front, like just how, you know, how, how important is it that leaders do actually come up with some kind of tangible plan sure. to tackle climate security? I mean, what, if they don't do that, what are we facing? Well, we're all already seeing, you know, just where we are right now, the intensity of storms is just vastly greater. Uh, the fires in Australia, the fires in, in the West Coast of the United States, they're just incomparably, and they have just gone like this in recent years. You see greater desertification, and the, therefore the pi migration of entire populations as a result of that. The, the, the refugee crises that, uh, that Europe experienced wasn't just the Syrian civil war, it was also populations in uh, Africa that were trying to make their way across the Mediterranean to a better life as well. Um, you will have water wars. You already have issues where, you know, the land of the two rivers where we spent so much uh, time over the past 20 years or so, the Marsh Arabs are no longer able really to survive down in the southern marshes in Mason and Basra the way that they used to because of climate change. The water isn't as substantial coming down the Tigris uh, and the uh, salination of the, the salt water is creeping ever further up uh, because as a result of that. So these are very, very serious issues. And you see the kind of uh, potential conflict over something like the Renaissance Dam that Ethiopia uh, has built and they're trying to fill it. But of course, that has implications for the flow of the Nile. Uh, the Nile is the, what gives Egypt its fertile crescent. So, so you have all of these issues and they are very, very, very serious. And of course, trying to mitigate the further changes that will be brought about by continued global warming and, and the changes that that ushers in, uh, this is very serious stuff. So, you know, it's not just because you have a democratic administration in the United States and the Department of Defense and the intelligence community say this is a very serious problem um, and something has to be done about it to, at the very least, mitigate the further changes that will result from all of this. How likely is it that there could that there will one day be a war over water? I think it's entirely likely. Um, again, if you look at how, for example, Iran has just completely mismanaged water resources, there's going to become there will come points at which. Uh, Whoever is upstream is not sending as much as before. Again, we actually do see it in the Tigris and Euphrates. Literally, we have seen it just in, you know, say the nearly 20 years since I was the commander of the 101st Airborne Division. We did the fight to Baghdad and then went up to Mosul where we had uh, the Tigris went right through our capital city. So I, I think those are very real prospects. And certainly you do see it again in places in Africa where they're fighting over grazing land, or you have, again, this does produce conflict. And I think you will see more of that as the intensity of the change continues. And, and do you think that it's, it, it could, could Glasgow, could the leaders in Glasgow do something that could stop a, a war over water? Or do you think it's too late? Or I just... don't know that, I mean, I tend to think that these are more tactical issues that are a result from factors that will emanate from what leaders do decide to do. But I mean, the fact is that what what they're talking about is mitigating the further rise, not stopping it, not reversing it, much less. Uh, there is a further rise projected. Then the question is, how much hotter is it going to be and how much you know, more of the ice will melt and how much more will the sea levels rise? You know, there are places in Miami, Florida that are flooded now uh, many weeks of the year. Um, so again, you just see this really uh, all throughout the world, and you see changes that are very, very substantial. I mean, I'm a big cyclist out in the mountain west during the summers. You've never, ever had smoke in the air in the past. Now, almost every, every year or so, there is smoke, Paul, coming over from the fires that just cannot be contained. Uh, and it's a new feature of the landscape and, and not a very attractive or, or welcome one. As we're sort of looking at, at big sort of geopolitical trends, uh, it would be remiss not to look at Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you know, first of all, to ask, given your experience during that, 20, you know, the, uh, the vast majority of that conflict, it was spanned over 20 years, but a big chunk of that was during your time in service. Um, what, what are your thoughts uh, as to how it's ended, first of all? Well, I don't think that the result 
uh, can be described as anything other than heartbreaking, uh, tragic, and frankly, disastrous. You know, however imperfect the Afghan government was, and there were many imperfections and flaws and maddening issues and corruption, all these others, surely the lot in life of 50% of the population at the very least was better in those days with some rural areas exception, certainly. Uh, but beyond that, just to see a regime come in that is essentially taking the country back to a seventh century interpretation of very conservative, strict Islam, similar to what they imposed on the country from 95 to 2001 or so. Um, I mean, the fact that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Afghans have voted with their feet to get out of the country, and there are tens, hundreds of thousands that are trying to, uh, and I get contacted by many of them through a variety of different means uh, to try to get assistance doing that. And there are tens of thousands left behind to whom we have a moral obligation, the special immigrant visa applicants who serve two years on the ground as battlefield interpreters with our forces uh, in, in combat, including one who was with our son uh, when he was a platoon leader in Afghanistan, where I was the commander, in fact. So again, I, I, I think it really is a heartbreaking development beyond that without relitigating the past and suggesting that perhaps there was another way, which I did do publicly at the time. And I did actually also um, warn that I feared a, a psychological collapse of the Afghan forces when we pulled not just our air power and those that brought air power to bear and our advisors and so forth, but when we pulled the 18,000 contractors who maintained the Afghan Air Force, which is the key to the whole defensive concept for Afghanistan. In a, in a country like that, with very limited infrastructure and lots of population centers and infrastructure you have to protect, there's no alternative but to have essentially basic soldiers that protect all that stuff. And then when they're hit by the Taliban or insurgents or extremists, uh, then you respond with a force that's really quite capable. It was the commandos, roughly 30,000, with very sophisticated U.S. helicopters, fixed-wing aircraft, close air support, and, uh, and so forth. Um, and that provided the reinforcements, the emergency resupply, the air medevac, uh, and also, again, close air support. When that gradually became less operational, and it did, and it got shot up, and it couldn't be maintained because the contractors had left, and they didn't have the capability to do that, it was just inevitable that Afghan forces were going to realize at some point nobody's coming to the rescue. And so, especially with local political figures who were already texting with the Taliban, they're going to cut a deal, which is what people do in a country like that. They, at some point, have to be professional chameleons to survive. So it was almost inevitable in, in a lot of ways, uh, certainly collapsed faster than most people seem to. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have pulled our soldiers out before we pulled out our diplomat and development workers, spies, and, and again, the special immigrant visa applicants, and not to mention U.S. citizens and green card holders, uh, which is where we were and when we had to go back in and do this. You know, on the one hand, what was a miraculous logistics feat, taking 123,000 people out, not all on our planes, but the bulk, um, but also a chaotic situation in which we didn't necessarily get all the ones that necessarily we wanted to get in some sequence or order. Um, so, but the real issue is that this is the looming humanitarian catastrophe of the world. This is going to be worse than anything anyone can imagine. Afghanistan was already one of the three poorest countries in the world. They had the worst harvest in 35 years. So even their own sort of agricultural production is way, way down. And then you have the entire economy collapse. You have people that had money and, and visas leave long ago. Uh, you have the U.S., which used to pay 75 percent of the budget. So together with Japan, U.K., and a handful of others. But, you know, we paid for all 300,000 of the Afghan security forces. I mean, Taliban is not going to be able to pay them uh, or nor pay their own soldiers uh, even, no matter how many little taxes and maybe illegal narcotics uh, exports that they do. Um, beyond that, of course, they don't have access to their foreign reserves and their, their uh, access to IMF special drawing rights and World Bank loans uh, are on hold. So this country is in a desperate situation. And of course, you don't even have the, the, the uh, technocrats, if you will, to he who even know how to run a lot of what is going on. I, th I think that the currency is even printed. It's outside the country. And I forget if it's here or where. But so even that is not. So you have enormous challenges. Um, and it's literally going to seize up. The electricity for uh, Afghanistan largely comes from the Central Asian states by power lines or is produced by 
refined fuel products that come from Iran, are they going to continue to provide that if they're not being paid over time? I don't know. Uh, and then you have a huge uh, effect on Pakistan, which, you know, Islamabad, ironically, was sort of cheering this because they sort of, you know, they're, they have now historic depth or what have you relative to India, which uh, is something, again, I'm not sure I understand knowing India not wanting to have another inch of Pakistani soil, frankly. But they are going to have this backflow of refugees, and you have extremists that are cheering what took place. The Tariqi Taliban Pakistani is back together for the first time. That's the Pakistani Taliban, not to be confused with the Afghan Taliban or the Haqqani Network or Haqqani Taliban or the IMU or Al-Qaeda. And you see the Islamic State carrying out very horrific attacks, uh, much more than the weekly basis that they make it into the news. There's attacks going on and you even see a resistance movement forming. So they you know, thought they took care of the Panjshir Valley. Well, not so fast. I mean, they're coming back in Masood's forces and then there's a force of Mizari Sharif in the north. So all of these different ethnic and sectarian and of course they've been putting down the Hazara, so they're going to have to respond. This is going to be an extraordinary uh, mess for the world. And we are not going to take this out of our rearview mirror uh, anytime soon. And we are going to have to figure out how to take care of fellow human beings while also not trying necessarily to strengthen the Taliban, which is going to be also very, very difficult to do. That just sounds an impossible problem. Do you, do you envisage the US, the UK, other allies having to go back in again? I have actually suggested that we ought to be back in the embassy. I mean, why wouldn't you be back in the embassy? Uh, there is security. You can put security forces in there if you need. I mean, the fear was, I think, that we felt that, I don't know, they, they will come over and take the embassy and do something like happened to our embassy in Tehran many years ago. Um, and I don't think that's a realistic fear. Um, it's a spectacular facility. I mean, it's $500 million worth of of embassy and we should be back in there and you're going to have to deal with the Taliban anyway we are dealing with them to get our remaining American citizens there's still a couple hundred of those and there's probably some green card holders and there are tens of thousands again of special immigrant visa applicants some approved plus multiple family members each and I'm on a part of a group called no one left behind which tries to help with those efforts and then it was another one to help the students from the American University of Afghanistan, which my wife and I have supported over the years as well. Um, given that you were such an architect of the strategy that was used in Afghanistan, um, that, that, that failed, let's just let's face it, to, um, to create a, a, a military a security and defense forces that could withstand once the American support withdrew, doesn't it mean that the entire kind of counterinsurgency doctrine that the US, the UK and others have followed over the last 20 years is, is, is completely f wrong, failed, no, faulty. Not at all, actually. And, and let me explain why. I mean, first, number one, Afghanistan is a unique contextual situation and um, very, very different from Iraq, for example. In fact, one of the times I did two, three and four, four star tours commands in Iraq, as you recall, including the surge, after the third Star, three star tour, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld asked me to come home through Afghanistan and do an assessment. The first slide in that briefing was titled, Afghanistan does not equal Iraq, and it laid out all the differences. And those differences I recalled for Congress some years later when I was sent to Afghanistan to be the commander. And I said, we will not be able to achieve in Afghanistan what we achieved in Iraq. The enemy is beyond our grasp. They're in Baluchistan and North Waziristan. Pakistan won't eliminate them from their soil and we're not authorized to go after them. So you're always going to be, you're never going to be able to put the pressure on the enemy that we did in, in Iraq. Beyond that, they have no money. Iraq had $100 billion when the price of oil was over $105 a barrel for Brent crude. Uh, Iraq had infrastructure. It actually had central government. It had much more educated population. There are vast differences. So first of all, the counterinsurgency field manual, if you will, that we developed when I was a three star in the United States between the three and four star tours in Iraq, I would contend provided a very good intellectual foundation for Iraq and the surge in Iraq, even its fiercest critics had to acknowledge that it succeeded in driving violence down by 85% and keeping it down. Don't forget that when we gradually withdrew our forces, it was down for the subsequent three and a half years. And what undid the results of the surge in Iraq, which brought the fabric of society back together between Sunni and Shia when it was on the verge, as you recall well, given your old profession there in that time, the verge of a civil war, and we drew them back from that, got 
again, stitches back into the fabric of society, what tore it apart was Prime Minister Maliki's highly sectarian action. So it's very, you can trace exactly what happened. And again, I think it was a successful application of the counterinsurgency doctrine that we all put together. Um, Afghanistan, again, I said that we would not be able to achieve what we did. I would have contended, I did contend, that what we had at the end with 3,500 troops was something that was unsatisfactory, but manageable. Um, so again, you have to acknowledge you're not going to win. You cannot win if the enemy is beyond your grasp and the country on whose soil they are located won't take care of it. But you can have a situation that is, again, manageable, that keeps our most important objective, of course, was that Islamist extremists not be able to reestablish a sanctuary that they enjoyed under Taliban rule when the 9-11 attacks were planned there. And of course, that's what we went there to do. Keep in mind that Afghanistan didn't just provide the platform for operations in Afghanistan against Al Qaeda and now also the Islamic State Khorasan group. They also, this is also the platform for the so-called regional campaign, uh, not all of which was always visible um, and nor reported because some of it was conducted reportedly under other authorities by uh, other than de Defense Department uh, personnel. But the the one that was reported, uh, of course, was the raid that got Osama bin Laden, uh, which was in the final months of my time as the commander conducted by our special mission unit force, well known SEAL Team 6. The president announced it. That was launched from Afghan soil, went into Pakistan, and, and of course came back. So we've lost that now as well. But again, I, I just would have contended that, you know, this is, it's very, very far from perfect. In fact, it's maddeningly you know, in some cases, uh, corrupt or what have you, but is that not just much, much better? And isn't it worth 25 or 3,500 US troops if your coalition partners had 8,500, which most of them are willing to, and, and it allows you to have 18,000 contractors that are the, again, the, the, the essential element for this force. You know, there have been some people who puzzlingly have said, well, gosh, you know, we never should have, um, should have made them more like the insurgents. And I have reminded these individuals, you know, they were not insurgents, they are counterinsurgents. And by the way, the Taliban are finding out it is much harder to be a counterinsurgent, to be responsible for securing everything everywhere that matters um, than it is just to be the guys that hang out in the hills and come out attack a, a soft spot when you find it and then go back into the hills. Um, and they're also, of course, finding out it's much harder to govern than it is to be on the back benches, if you will, or at least in the valleys casting aspersions uh, on the Afghan government, um, and because they're going to have a very, very challenging time. Uh, I'm going to ask one last question, sure. then we're going to go to the Q&A, because they're, they're mounting up. Um, uh, General Milley has talked about this, uh, you know, about concerning this development of this Chinese yeah. um, nuclear capable hypersonic weapon system that's yes. been fired. How much of a moment is that? How, how significant is that? It's interesting. I, I, I know General Mark Milley very, very well. We served in combat together many times with friends. Um, and you have to be very careful to read exactly what he said, which is sort of almost a Sputnik moment, yeah. something like that. Yeah. It's a qualified. Not quite. The Sputnik moment was a big deal. I mean, that's when we learned that Russia could, or the Soviet Union could do something that we could not at that time uh, do. Uh, and of course, they beat us, you know, in the early days of the space race, which was, you know, very, very concerning. And then we launched our big effort and eventually uh, caught up and surpassed them. And then, of course, worked together. Uh, and so this is a big deal uh, because hypersonic weapons are something that can obviously travel vastly uh, faster than do uh, other systems, although not faster, by the way, by something that's actually out in intercontinental uh, ballistic missile necessarily, um, but they can invalidate any kinds of ballistic missile defense that one could conceive of. So not that we really had a ballistic missile defense that could do more than perhaps do something against North Korea, or perhaps, you know, if some other country ever got a nuclear weapon that uh, might actually use it, but had very limited numbers, very limited capabilities, trajectories, no multiple reentry vehicles and so forth. So, but, but it is, and, and it's just another sign really, because uh, China's advances are very, very impressive uh, in all the different fields. They have identified the technologies of the future and they are investing very heavily in them, which is one of the reasons, of course, why the US and many other countries are investing in infrastructure in ways that we have, that have just not been, there's no precedent for 
in the United States. Uh, and again, if this multiple trillions of dollars of spending, it, it includes a lot of these different areas, that is going to be an enormous boost uh, to the economy. Yes, the debt to GDP ratio is going to go up. And if we're not modern monetary theorists, we might be concerned about that. But but the the impact of that for the years that lie ahead is going to be really very substantial. But that does mean, you know, there is a competition. And of course, you'll have seen that very recently, there's a lot of debate. Is this a Cold War, a new Cold War or whatever? And I think most folks tend to think that that analogy is not all that helpful because the circumstances of the Cold War were so very, very different. There was no economic interdependence. I mean, China is, depending on which category you have, either number one, two, or three trading partner for the US, along with Canada and Mexico, which are, of course, our North American neighbors. Um, and it's the top trading partner for another 80 or 90 countries around the world. It's not like the Soviet Union, which occasionally bought some excess wheat from Western farmers that we were trying to get off their hands. Um, this is a very, very different dynamic, but there clearly are areas of competition, and we have to be very, very clear and careful to avoid miscalculation, misperception, and mistakes. So just quick yes or no answer. Um, the, the now former first ever software chief at the Pentagon resigned in protest, he said, um, at the slow pace of technological um, sort of uh, transformation in the US military, saying that you know, China was, was set to be dominant in AI, cyber, uh, machine learning. Do you agree? Not necessarily. I mean, okay. first of all, I don't know. I, I didn't know I, I him. Just, I never talked to him. It's, I a great, it's, them, it's an but... interesting one. Um, yeah. You know, I saw that. The, the difference, of course, is that so much of our advances uh, are going on by private companies. And of course, you know, I'm in, in the investment world and have, so we own 110 companies around the world. We own a lot of high tech uh, firms. But, and, and of course, your deep mind, I don't think was a government sponsored, although I could be wrong. It might have been tied to it, you know, because many of these are tied to a university in some way. But of course, it was, I think Google eventually bought DeepMind, um, although the individuals are still here, I believe. But again, it's, it shows you the impact of the private sector uh, in the US, not that there is not a vibrant private sector in, in China, but an awful lot of that is also, uh, again, government uh, funded, government overseen. And of course, the, the government is getting into some of these uh, a bit more. But again, we do have to do better. And there have been a variety of uh, initiatives uh, in the Defense Department and elsewhere. And you have to do it across the board. And it's not just military applications. It's AI writ large. It's machine learning. It's biotech. It's all of these different areas if we're to remain competitive in the world. And we will be. And okay. we're pretty determined to be. Thank you very much. So now this is, uh, I'm going to take some questions. Okay. So this is off the record, so you can be yep. 